All right, good evening, everyone. I am Councilman Chris Nettles. I represent the Fort Worth City Council, District Number 8. Let me start out by saying it has been an honor and a privilege to represent you as your voice on the Fort Worth City Council. And that's what this meeting is all about tonight, is to make sure that your voices are heard and we come to some uh, resolve and information that you need to have at your mindset. So I think we see things locally, we see things through newspapers, we see things through websites, but we don't know the history behind the conversation. And so tonight, this is gonna be a conversation. And we're gonna uh, take questions, we're gonna listen to you, take your ideas, and we will respond back to you. Now, there's a lot of people in this room, so we wanna be respectful of everybody's time and everybody's questions. We have allotted an hour to have this conversation, and so we're going to begin the conversation. And so some of you may know that there has been a request and a proposal to uh, lease, long-term lease, the historic Southside Community Center land for the National Juneteenth Museum. That is what this, this conversation is about tonight. It's important that you know what's going on. And so we have... Mr. Jerry Howard, who is here, who is the CEO of the National Juneteenth Museum, who is going to give his presentation. This is something that he's presented to the city of Fort Worth, to the community and the neighbors. And so he's gonna present that to you tonight. We also want to inform you what is happening at Historic Southside. Repairs that need to be done, the programs that are happening at the Southside. If this does happen, where are those programs going to go? What's going to happen to um, the community center? And so we have those, some of those updates tonight for you. But we also want to hear what your thoughts are so we can include that into the whole discussion. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to ask Mr. Jerry Howard to come and do his presentation. Oh, y'all are too nice. Well, good evening, everybody. Not good enough. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much. I feel a whole lot better. Uh, my name is indeed Jared Howard, and it is an absolute privilege to be here talking to you all because we've got a pretty good story, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to tell it to everybody that we'd like to. Well, this presents another opportunity for us to tell our story. And we think you'll like the story, but uh, without further ado, in response to Councilman, Net Net Councilman Nettles, say that three times real fast, Councilman Nettles' uh, edict to be done in an hour, I'm going to be really, really quickly. Uh, I'm going to show a really quick film, a four-minute film, and then I'm going to come back and, and tell you a little about what we're doing, and then I'll take some questions from the floor. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Let's see. Let's see if I can work this technology. Councilman Nettles, you mind flipping that to the right? It's not working. There you go. All right, so several... It's on now? Okay, thank you, Councilman. I think I got it. Okay, we got it. Let me move out the way. Several years ago, um, there was a vision to reinvent the way we view and experience the historic South Side. For those that may not know, for those that may not be from Fort Worth, the historic South Side represents, for all intents and purposes, the epicenter of black life in the city of Fort Worth historically. Before there was a stop six, there was a historic South Side. Before there was a Como, there was a South Side. And so when black people planted their flag in the city of Fort Worth, they did it right here in the historic South Side. Uh, Ms. Jan can tell you all about Mr. William Gooseneck, Bill McDonald, and all the things that he did for the community. But he had two things that people post-emancipation did not have, black people didn't have. He had land and he had money. So what he did was he made his land and his money available to people that look like you and I more than 100 years ago to build this incredible community. And that is why when people converge on Fort Worth to learn about black history, you really do have to start here. The Mount Zion Church is more than 100 years old. 
The Mount Pisgah church is more than 100 years old. There are several 100-year-old-plus churches in this community, and that's because for a long time black people have been, have been here. With that said, several years ago there was a vision, right, to recreate what we know as the historic South Side. But the, the last thing we would have done was go and build something without talking to the people that are the purveyors of the space right here. And so what you see reflected on your screen is a meeting from several years ago with leaders of this community talking to our team of architects because before we were going to initiate anything or build anything, we wanted to hear what the community's perspectives were. What would you like to see? What would you like to be included in this vision? Some of the things that they told us are reflected here, and I apologize about the, the bad view. I'll read some of them. They wanted something that was open and inviting. They wanted something that wasn't particularly tall, that didn't overwhelm the rest of the, the neighborhood, Miss Jerry. They wanted something that had green space. They wanted something that, that would be the center of, the, of attention for the historic South Side. And so based on the feedback that they gave us, our architects went back and they went to work. What did they come up with? I'm going to show you a four-minute film that will give you an overview of what the result of those conversations were. Give me just a second. I'm Opal Lee, and I'm called the grandmother of Juneteenth. Been around a long time. Juneteenth is the day that General Gordon Granger arrived in Texas telling everybody that the enslaved were free. We started celebrating and we've been celebrating ever since. In 2016, I did a walking campaign in major cities to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. I collected a million five hundred thousand signatures along the way. But to be able to go to the White House, to see the bill passed into law, that was off the chain. This is the pin that President Biden used to sign Juneteenth into law. <gasps> but I tell you, Juneteenth's more than a holiday. It's about celebrating freedom. So we're going to continue this celebration in this new museum in my hometown, The historic South Side in the late 18, early 1900s was the epicenter of black life in the city of Fort Worth. And a gentleman named William Madison McDonald, who happened to have been Texas' first black millionaire, crafted and curated the neighborhood with his dollars, with all the things that a neighborhood needs to be successful. Culturally, spiritually, economically, it was all there. But in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the government built highways around the neighborhood, essentially identifying it as unworthy of investment. And this was a common practice in cities like Fort Worth across the U.S. As you walk around the neighborhood today, you see many empty lots, places where there used to be homes. Half the people that live in the neighborhood live below the poverty line. The life expectancy in this neighborhood is 12 years below the national average. What we ultimately want to do is create change. This museum will be much more than just a museum. In addition to artifacts and both permanent and touring exhibitions that narrate the Juneteenth story, we'll also have a food hall, black box space, theater, business incubator, and some culture-centric retail. The program became the foundation of what the museum will become, the full experience of emerging black culture. The Juneteenth flag was a real motivator to us in our design process. The 12 freedoms that were gained on Juneteenth were the North Star for how the program was arranged. The museum and the, the greater development will literally be a catalyst to changing the trajectory of a neighborhood that's been neglected for a very long time. Jobs, commerce, culture, lots of other things back to the historic South Side. The economic impact will be immeasurable. On an annual basis, the museum will create more than $24 million of total impact 
and bring more than 200 jobs to the community. The museum will serve as a beacon for our black communities nationally and be a representation of the joy of emancipation that can resonate globally. None of us are free until we're all free. And we're not free yet. And the Juneteenth Museum is going to get us a lot closer to that idea. This bold project to build a national treasure can only become a reality with the help of bold people. So uh, that's what we're building, but where are we building it? Do I have a laser here? Nope. All right, so what you see is an aerial of East Rosedale Street just east of I-35. When we first had conversations about this, we were going to build the museum on this corner right here that is the former home of Miss Opal's Juneteenth Museum. Y'all remember the Miss Opal's Museum that used to be there? So, <laughs> All right, well, um, so, so we recognized a few years ago that that was probably the ideal site for it because we would simply scale what already existed there. Well, as we started talking to our architects and as we started to explore the opportunity, the vision grew. And so what was initially going to be on this corner right here grew, and then we were going to go here. Well, as we started to talk about the possibility of Juneteenth and the possibilities associated with Juneteenth, Juneteenth became a federal holiday, which meant the popularity of Juneteenth grew. So we saw it as an opportunity, so we started to acquire additional property. We have acquired all of the land that you all see here. How many of you all remember this house that was right there on Veal Street, on Verbena Street? We demolished it about a year and a half or so ago, right? There were people squatting in there. We learned about it. We tore the building down. So as the vision grew, we discovered that we did not have enough real estate to build this big vision that incl included all these different services. And so we attempted to acquire as much real estate as we possibly could, but we were not able to acquire one swath of land. The, o the owner of that land didn't want to sell it. He has his own vision for that property, which is absolutely his right. right? Well, in light of the fact that the vision had grown, that meant we needed to pivot. So the point I'm making here is the original intent was not to be here. The original intent was to be here. And if you look us up, we own, again, we own all of this land right there. We've acquired all of that real estate over the last several years. Well, when we learned that we weren't going to be able to acquire all the land that we needed, we needed to pivot to another site. There were a couple of options, and that, that is when we discovered that the city of Fort Worth had no plans, you tell me if I'm wrong, Councilman Nettles, uh, had no plans to renovate the, the Southside Community Center which was in a great deal of disrepair. How many, how many of you all know that the building is in disrepair right now, right? Fair statement, just a fact, right? And so when we discovered that the city wasn't going to invest any significant dollars into the building, eventually what would happen is the building would grow older and older and eventually be condemned. The last thing we would do was allow a resource like the community center to come outside of the neighborhood, so we thought there might be an opportunity. So called Councilman Nettles and Mayor Parker and City Manager Cook, and I said, hey, how possible is it, how viable is it that we acquire the historic South Side? And uh, they didn't have an answer for me initially. They had to explore. And this is part of that exploration, right? So the reason that that is particularly viable is because we are committed to the historic South Side. Let me say that again. We are committed to the historic South Side. Why do all of the beautiful assets and resources have to go to other communities, right? This is the place where it ought to be. This is the what's going to happen when we build the museum is people that look like us, many of us are going to come and converge on Fort Worth, start spending money in Fort Worth, start staying in ho hotels in Fort Worth, and bring jobs to Fort Worth. We don't want all of that opportunity to go outside of the neighborhood. We want it to be right there in the heart of our neighborhood. And so as a consequence, that's when we started to explore the site that we're looking at right now. Let me go a little bit forward and, and be this is the land that is, we are exploring, acquiring right now from the city of Fort Worth. Now remember, when we first started the conversation, we were here, and then here, and then here, and then we had hoped to acquire, acquire all of that. But since we could not do that, 
the next best option for us, at least as far as our architects are concerned, is the, the land that you see right there, which is uh, the Southside Community Center. There is a view of the museum. Can you all see that? A couple of things about the architectural design. Uh, Miss Jerry and Mr. Johnny and other neighborhood stakeholders told us a couple of things in that initial meeting that I, I showed you. They said they wanted it to fit optically within the scope of the neighborhood that already exists. In, in other words, they didn't want us to build a, sta a spaceship in the middle of the south side, right? So what you see on this building is something that actually looks like a big house. All of the homes on the historic south side were built with the gabled roof line, that A line. Well, if you notice the perimeter of the building, gabled roof lines. Shotgun homes, which is what many of us grew up in, all of them had one thing in, in common, which was a front porch, right? If you look at the perimeter of the building, all of these little portals have an area outside, right, for people to hang out and do things. Hang out, um, eat dinner, take the sun in, read a book, whatever the case be. That's because that's what exists in the neighborhood right now. But in the middle of the, the building, I'll bring to your attention this hole. This hole, if you were to look directly aerial from a bird's eye view, is carved out into the shape of the Juneteenth star. Right? So in the middle of that building that looks like a bunch of houses put together, you have a, a star carved out. In the interior of the building, there's going to be a courtyard for people to come and drink a cup of coffee, read a book, they'll be protected from the sun. Right? Remember, this was built with the community in mind. These are resources that we don't have right now that we will have once we build this building. So there's a, an image of the building. Here's another view of the building. This is looking north from the south side of Rosedale, Rosedale in New York. This will be an LED screen, assuming the city of Fort Worth blesses us to be able to do an LED screen. Why do you want an LED screen, right? So we can promote things, so we can send messages, right? So there might, maybe there's something happening in the community and we want people to know about it. We'll be able to tell them right there on that corner, right? So that's enough about the building. Let's talk about some of the programs inside the building. The only restaurant in the historic South Side that you can go to and sit down and have a meal in is what? Jack in the Box. The only, let me say that again for the people that didn't hear me the first time. The only restaurant in the historic South Side where you can go and sit down and have a meal is a Jack in the Box. How many of us go in the Jack in the Box, sit down and eat dinner? Right. We live in, people that live here live in the middle of a food desert. There's a great deal of food insecurity. Well, that dynamic is going to change because one of the things that those people told us early on was they wanted restaurants. So in the food hall, we're not going to have one or two or three or four. We'll have five restaurants there. So no longer, y'all remember Drake's Cafeteria? Y'all remember leaving church on a Sunday afternoon and going to Drake and get rabbits? How many of y'all eat rabbits? It's okay to admit it. R right? So we'll, we'll, again, talking about re-identifying what people know as the historic South Side, that will come back because we'll have five food vendors in the museum. But guess what? There won't be McDonald's. It won't be Chick-fil-A. It won't be Jack in the Box. It, it won't be Chick-fil-A. It'll be people in the community that own these spaces. Right? We're already having conversation with local black entrepreneurs to occupy these spaces. Right? So you'll come here and get food that you can't get anywhere else in the city of Fort Worth. Y'all know culture sells. People are looking for culture. When you want to go get Hispanic culture, you go to the north side. And it's there in abundance. Right? When you want to get Asian culture, there are pockets of that. Where in the city of Fort Worth can you go and get just rabid black culture? It doesn't exist. We want to create that. So a food hall is coming. In addition to the food hall, I told you about the courtyard. In addition to the courtyard, we've got a 250-seat theater. Quick story. When I was 10 and 11 years old, I was a member of a uh, theater company right here in the historic South Side called the Sojourner Truth Players. Who remembers it? Right? Right there on the corner of Fabens and Rosedale. I was a member of that. From the, from the Sojourner Truth Players came a guy named Rudy Eastman. Anybody know who Rudy Eastman is? Rudy Eastman is the guy that founded the Jubilee Theater. If you remember, it used to be on Rosedale. It was on Rosedale twice. And then they went downtown Fort Worth. Well, guess what? We have a theater, so maybe the next Jubilee Theater can operate right here 
in the historic South Side? Why should we have to go outside of our community to get entertainment? We shouldn't. So inside the National Juneteenth Museum will be a 250 seat theater for local performances. I know Ms. Jerry wants to do a talent show for the children in the community. Well, where are we gonna do it? Well, that dynamic will change because here we're gonna have a theater. Another thing that's not pictured here is a business incubator. Now, for those that may not be aware, of what a business, be aware of what a business incubator is, it is essentially a place where entrepreneurs come and get resources to build successful businesses. It's going to be inside the museum, right? So we'll be able to curate entrepreneurs. Maybe the people that grow up and graduate from Pascal or Poly won't be doctors or lawyers, but guess what? They might be a plumber. And if he or she is going to be a plumber, why does he or she have to work for another company? Why can't he or she open her, his or her own plumbing business? So we're going to train people on how to be entrepreneurs in the business incubator. And the last thing that's not reflected here, and I'll show you those in a minute. I got about five minutes, Councilman Nettles. Uh, the last thing that's going to be here is what we call a black box space. A black box space is essentially a large room that can be configured for a number of different purposes, right? If you want to have a wedding reception, you can rent the black box theater to do it. If you want to have a dance party for your teenagers, you can rent the black box space to do it. If we're going to have a polling location, the black box theater can serve as that. I know that the Southside Community Center is a polling place for many, many people, and I know it, it is heartbreaking to think that you'd have to go anywhere else. Well, if you will cover your nose for a couple of years, Barring any uh, prohibition from the federal government, this will be a polling location again. That is a promise from the National Juneteenth Museum to this community. If we will be allowed to, it will, the polling place will come back as a part of the museum. We will not program around elections. All right, let's talk about the inside of the museum. We're going to tell the Juneteenth story. I won't spend a lot of time here, but just know that we've hired one of the best experienced design firms in the world. The one thing I'll bring to your attention is this slide right here. And the reason for that is because it's talking about building community. And so when you talk about the historic South Side, all those things that used to exist here, they'll be reflected in this exhibition gallery, right, in homage to the city of Fort Worth because of the pride that we have in the city of Fort Worth. I think I got one more slide, Council Monettos. Uh, that's the story of the National Juneteenth Museum in a really, really quick and expedited way. Council Monettos. Thank you, uh, Jerry. So what we're gonna do now is move towards um, some updates about the Southside Community Center. And Ms. Monique is gonna come and do that. But I do wanna make sure that everybody does have uh, the Juneteenth Museum survey, the Southside Community Center and Juneteenth survey. We want you to fill that out before you leave today and turn that back in to city staff um, that's here. All right, you want to come? And then we're going to take questions next. Good evening. Good evening. How are y'all doing? Good. I am going to load my uh, presentation here, so if you'll just bear with me really quick. I'll give that back to you. Okay. Thank you. What's it called? That's Southside Public. Okay. It should have just been ready for the room. Okay. So Jerry's going to help me with that. So hopefully that was a lot of information, good information, and at the end we'll um, answer questions for you. Um, while he's doing that, I am Monique Hill. I am the Assistant Director of the Park and Recreation Department. I'm over the Recreation Division. Um, and so we're here today to talk to you about um, Southside Community Center and give you some clarity. Uh, hopefully we can calm any nerves that you may have um, about the transition, possible transition. Nothing is final. Okay. So a little bit about the community center. Um, the community center was constructed in 1970. 
and it was then renovated with community development block grant funds. You'll hear me say CDBG um, in 1980, 1981-ish. Um, I will tell you, I had the great opportunity to meet uh, Ms. Hazel Harvey Peace, who used to tell me the whole story about how that happened. Um, so the center has been renovated in times prior because of some of the similar issues that we are having and facing right now with the facility. Um, we have a nice size f facility, 19,000 square feet, almost 20,000 square feet. And then we have five uh, staff. Right now we have a vacancy at this um, community center, but we have five uh, full-time staff there. And then we have roughly a budget of $367,000 to operate the facility. That's just our operational cost. So some of the things we offer right now are after school program, we have summer day camp program, and then we also have what's called school break camp. So anytime Fort Worth ISD is out, we offer programming for our youth. And so it's just like a day camp or fall break, winter break. And so our children that go there from ages five to 13, we recently changed that or are changing that to five to 12. So during those programs, we have our school age youth that are available. We have a best years club, and I know some of them are here today. Uh, that is our program for older adults. Um, if you've heard of Step in Granny, a lot of them go there uh, to the center. And then we also have VITA, which is our volunteer income tax assistance program at the facility as well. And then community action partners program, that's usually the one people say, oh, that's the bill pay program. So we have that, which is CAP. Um, that's also in our facility. And then um, Jared mentioned that we are a very viable and vibrant polling site. We uh, host early elections and election day as well. Um, we have contractors and vendors that come over to our community centers. So basically what that means is if someone has a program, they have an expertise, uh, they want to use our center, they may have a contract where they provide a free uh, program. So one of our programs that we have is uh, Pretty Blessed Girls. So Pretty Blessed Girls is a mentoring program. They utilize our facility on the second and fourth Saturday. And then we also see, and I see some members of VIP uh, in the back who are also um, part of our community center that use it as a base as well. So those are some of our programming that we have there. And then obviously if people need to use the facility for rentals, if they want to use it for birthday parties, uh, anything like that, we have those at, um, available to you as the public. So a little bit about the facility. I mentioned to you earlier that it was renovated back in the 80s. Um, one of the things that triggered some of the things that we had issues with was ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. So through this, we found that the facility was not compliant. So initially we thought, oh, we can try to, you know, get all those things fixed. We had a study done between 22, 2020 and 2022. At that time, we found out that we had more problems on our hands than we thought. Initially, we thought we could fix some of the things in the facility. Uh, we had some funding available to do so. But unfortunately, every time we went in to get a study, try to make a plan, those things still continue to persist and not improve. And so it was causing the cost to increase in which we did not have that funding. Um, so some of the things that we have, if you've been in our facility, is that we have the wall where the library used to be, if y'all are familiar with the facility. Um, that wall actually has a little bit of a lean. You can't really see it, but if you go in and look long enough, you probably, <laughs> you probably could. Um, you'll notice that there's several elevations in that community center, so you may go from downstairs, go back upstairs, then you're going in another area. Um, what we have found is along where that, um, the old library was in our activity room, when you're walking in there, you can literally see the floor starting to cave in and separate from the building. Um, so we have some serious foundational issues, none that cause issues to you or that are harmful, but certainly things that we feel like need to be addressed. Um, and then also with our ADA compliance, we have some site issues. So anytime that you build a new facility, you have to be very careful. So we went in thinking we could fix some things, right? So unfortunately, when you start moving things around and changing things, it triggers a state law. 
and if you start building and making a number of changes, that entire facility has to become ADA compliant. And so with that, again, our cost was driven up a lot more. So because of that, we would have to sprinkle the building with sprinklers, which it did not have because it's older. It was grandfathered in. Um, likewise, we thought that there was going to be an additional issue with asbestos. Uh, when you get to disturbing things, you are now creating an environmental challenge, as well as some of the sidewalks leading into the facility. So as you know, money that we may have had before doesn't go as far as it used to uh, go now. Um, one of the things we wanted to do, if you all remember, there was a daycare there, there was a, a clinic there, so we had a number of things in the building. We have tried, and our staff are here too, but they have tried, 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 even when I was the manager there, to reprogram those spaces. Even we, I call them the baby toilets, <laughs> we tried to go in and fix that. Uh, we've done a number of things to make it usable space, but at this time it's just really starting to live outside of its life cycle and its lifespan without us, without, it, without us being able to really raise that money for it. So early on during this time, internally we have funding, I mentioned CDBG, that we can pull from depending on the neighborhood. So we call it low to moderate income communities that may qualify for funding. We had this funding available to make some of these changes. Once we finished with the study, the money that we had just did not stretch as far as we thought it would, which would require, truthfully, for us to just say, this building has reached the end of its life. I mean, it's at its point at this time. Um, we've had a number of issues, and those that still go to the center know that our restrooms were in pretty bad shape. Um, we've gotten those renovated trying to make sure that we accommodate the needs and the use of the center and make sure you're comfortable, but again, still not meeting compliance for the state. And unfortunately, uh, that leaves us where we cannot um, get everything up to the compliance where it serves you, where you can come in and be proud of a facility, but also our renovation costs, honestly, patching it costs more than building a whole new facility. And ultimately, that's where we ended up. So the biggest thing is what happens. What happens to the programming? What happens to the staff that are there? What happens to all the services that you knew? So we are working really closely. There are a number of other, municip other municipal buildings, churches, and nonprofits that are in the area. So we are working with those other facilities so that we can relocate those, those programs to make sure that they are not just left out um, without the community still receiving the services that you knew. So we're looking at moving all of these all within less than a mile of where they are currently. Um, so we would be able to relocate some of our youth program and senior programs that we have over to a Tatiana Carr Jefferson um, at Hillside. We would be utilizing the library, United Community Center, which is Bethlehem Center, and then likewise, if need be, uh, Hazel Harvey Peace is one of our Community Action Partners programs uh, would go there. So we have neighborhood services that currently has programming um, that oversees our CAP program. And so those programs would go there. So we're still trying to keep everything within the community so that you receive the same service. And uh, Jared reassured us that we would make sure that we have some space for community meetings, which is promising and hopeful uh, for us. Um, another thing that we are working on, it is time for us to start preparing for the 2026 bond election. When we go through those uh, processes, we look at all of our buildings that are in the, in the community, as far as our community centers, and create an index of those buildings. Um, prior to, are you familiar with the MLK Hub project that's going on in Stop 6 right now? Okay, so prior to that, Southside was almost neck and neck with that, but again, we kind of felt like, oh, we have these funds. So we have an index that we use to talk about the health of the building. And so with that, we are looking at, and have not confirmed, but we are looking at um, a complete rebuild of a Tatiana Carr Jefferson uh, at Hillside. 
So for us, it's promising to think that we would be having a museum come here and then with the possibility um, if we go through all the processes of having a new community center here as well. With that, we would be shifting staff in places, staff are not losing jobs, um, but we would also shift programming so that it's available, that we can have something nice in the community and make sure that we, do, we are bigger and better in what we do in providing um, services to the community. Okay, Council Member Nettles. And I will reiterate again, we're getting ready to take questions. I'll reiterate again, what you have seen tonight are merely recommendations, thought patterns, trying to think through. So when we come to this meeting, we have something to offer as what is what could happen, what can transpire. Um, and so, and that's all, and, and Jerry can come on, and Jerry and I have already had conversations about how we can also have some of those programmings that are happening at the center be inside of the National Juneteenth Museum as well. And I think some are shaking your heads and I think some of you have that same questions. And so we're talking through that process and, and um, we're gonna take questions. We're at 6.42. We, so let me tell you, we have city management staff that's here. We have city attorney that's here. We have neighborhood services that are here and parks and recs, uh, myself and Jared Howard. So we're able to answer any of the, the questions that we have, we have the mic. You have the mic. <clears throat> All right, if you have a question, please raise your hand. <clears throat> James Walker. Thank you, I appreciate that. Appreciate it, Councilman Nettles. Appreciate it, uh, Jared. I don't have a question, really. Uh, my name is James, and I'm the president of the uh, Historic Southside Neighborhood Association over here. And um, we've been working di diligently in order to try to get this uh, Southside up to par and what it used to be, as you know, because you attended meetings. Jared has attended several meetings. He came out and did a lot of um, uh, feeding the community with the museum and what they have going on. So. When the community um, committee met, what we decided or what we thought maybe would help out everybody in the community because everybody used that community as to what she was saying for us, programs, voting rights, um, after school programs, and we would like for those uh, programs to stay within the community. Uh, the elderly, a lot of them may have transportation issues and whatnot, so trying to go to, I saw on the slide, trying to go up to Hillside and cross Rosedale, I just don't think that would, I don't think, and with kids also in Italy, I just don't think that would be beneficial for the people that's in the community. So we want to try to keep everything here. And one of our suggestions was that we, we sent over a letter of support for Jared to go ahead and use the Southside Community Center. But with that, what we were asking is to couple something in black and white where we can get a new community center built right here in the neighborhood. So I was doing some research and come to find out that we are actively working in Glenwood Park, which I don't know if everybody knows, Glenwood Park is a 37 acre park that's located right off of Riverside Drive in Rosedale. And we've been cleaning it up, cleaning out the homeless and doing what we can so the community can actually use the park because they haven't been able to do that. Now the city has agreed and uh, allowed us to uh, hire uh, architect that gave us funds to do a master plan so we're working on a master plan right now in order to put uh, more pavilions in the park more lighting trash and uh, walking trail and an, uh, a number of things to so the community can have somewhere to be able to go and enjoy the park in the community but within that park at the back end of the park it's about an uh, acre and a half of land that's already zoned uh, for commercial use so the current place where the museum sit, it sits on about two acres. So if you take that acre and a half and maybe carve out another 0.5, you still have the same amount of space that you have for this community uh, there. And if we can use the funds from the bond money, however that works, because I believe the bond money, the bond funds is made up of our tax dollars. So with the amount of houses that's been built over in this area, probably over the last two years, I don't know if somebody may can fact check this, but 
we had about 200 houses that have been built in this community, along with some of the houses me and my partner Thomas have built ourselves. So with the bond fund money, we should be able to come together with the city, working together, and try to figure out how can we get the money to build us a brand new community center. And temporarily, yeah, we can use Havel Harvey Peace. We can use whatever re other buildings that's here in order to use those facilities temporary while we wait on a new community center to be built. And that's just coming from the Historic Southside Neighborhood Association. OK, so let me, let me do this. Thank you, James, for that. Now, James is the uh, president of the Neighborhood Association. And if you live in the historic South Side and you are not a part of the Neighborhood Association, I want to encourage you to see him or Miss Jerry before you leave so you can be a part of the Neighborhood Association. Now, let me just, this is for questions and ideas. I let them speak because they did do an, uh, a letter of support. Uh, but if you have a question or an idea uh, that you want to offer up, that's what we're asking for in the next 15 minutes. Okay, my name is Johnny Lewis, and uh, I've been around this neighborhood about 50 years, and used to work real good with Monique years ago, back when I was a little bit younger. Um, but my, but my, my, I want to, I want to follow up on what, on what Walker just said. I don't think this should be the end of the meeting. I think this should be the beginning. I think there should be another meeting so that we bring you back together. And what we do is then, rather than have a lot of, have these presentations, is that we then sit down and begin to break up and then do and, and explore ideals of what we can do. He's right. We have removed over probably 20 tons of, 20 tons of garbage from Glenwood Park. That park is yours. It's been there. It's a beautiful park. It has a waterfall. So I would suggest that we not just have this last meeting, Councilman Nell, but that we schedule another meeting soon so that we can begin to put down the things that we would like to see. That park would be an excellent place for a community center. It would, have, it would provide you with space for programming. It would provide space for creativity. And it would, put, and it would de definitely make that park useful for future endeavors. So my suggestion is that we not stop this meeting, but we also plan another meeting so you bring your pencils, pads together, and all the other people who live in this community, and that we begin to come up with, some pot, with, with something for, for future, and we can do something. Thank you. Okay. Anyone have a question? Yes, ma'am. Just one second. She raised her hand. I got you next, sir. Thank you. Yep, right to you. Do I need to stand up? You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need to so you can see who Come we on. are. Okay, let her <laughs> hold, 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 hold on so she stands okay, up. Okay, I'm take my sweater off. Thank you. Take my sweater off. Because this is why we <laughs> Okay. My name, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Deborah Rivers, and I'm the president of the Fort Worth Southeast Chapter 4508 AARP. We use the community center for our meeting place. We have been there since 1980, let me be sure, since 1989. And my question, you want to you take that community center, use it for the museum. I have no problem. We have no problem with that. We need all the, everything in this, uh, this area. But where are you going to let, have a, let us meet? We, that is a convenient location for us. And as I said, we've been there so long. And I'm asking, can we meet at uh, the uh, Hazel Harvey Peace Building? Will you have a space in the museum for us to meet? and you're tearing down the uh, center, where are you going to build another one that won't be so far? Because some of our members actually walk to the center, along with the children. And I have more. If you want my letter, I want your letter. I do. And you probably already have my comments. OK. Thank you. So Jared, I'm going to let you answer one of those questions. I want to answer a question. So yeah. 
uh, when we, I kind of articulated earlier, there, is, there has not been a plan to build another Southside Community Center. That's what, that's what we need here. Right, right, that's what I'm, just what I'm saying. And so that's why this, this conversation is, that's why we're having this conversation. So we want to be crystal clear that if that, music, if that community center is torn down and the museum takes it over, there will not be another Southside Community Center built. And, and we'll give the history of how we build community centers. That's what we just talked about in the bond. The, you sure. yeah. So I wanted to answer the, uh, one of the first questions from AARP. Um, we would not let you all not have a place to meet. We would work with some of the facilities that I named so that you all could have a meeting location. Um, there was a reference about some of our uh, seniors being able to go to another center from Hillside, but I would like to remind you that Fellowship Corner is where we had initially our senior program, which is right down the street from Hillside. So I really am not as concerned about people getting over there. Uh, we partner with Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels provides transportation, mits tickets, and all of that to make sure that our uh, older adults make it over to the this community center. They would just simply move wherever we move to make sure that people are there. But traditionally and historically, the program was at Fellowship Corner. Um, and so we wouldn't have an issue with that. As far as our after school programs, we do have a 15 passenger or 14 passenger minus a driver uh, vehicle where we actually staff pick up our youth and bring them over to the community center. So we do have uh, vehicles and transportation. Um, you asked about how we make our selections. So I don't know if Dave wants to speak to that, but I mentioned earlier an index. We look at the uh, health of the building, the facility structure, how long the facility was built, programs that are in it, and what condition the building is in when we are looking at selecting uh, community centers. And so what our talks have to be is what's up next because we only get so much money. And so we don't have a lot of money. We want to make sure we're wise with the money that we do receive. And so with that, we try to look at certain facilities. And literally, it's like an order of priority. And so for us, looking at Hillside has been one of the priorities in which we are looking at because it too needs to be replaced. We traditionally build our facilities about a mile and a half uh, radius from one another and so we do look at what other programs are there, what things are competition, what are the things that we have uh, that are already making, have, having the same, meeting the same need uh, in the area as well. So we have to look at those things as well um, when we're talking about building community centers. Thank you. Jerry, uh, she asked the question, is there any um, uh, would you guys allow these programs, since some can walk to this location, would you allow these programs to be in the National Juneteenth Museum? Y yes, with a caveat, right? So the museum needs to be self-sustainable because the city of Fort Worth is not going to help us operate the museum. What that means is if there is a private event that would be happening on Tuesday at 12 o'clock, which might be the time that you all might have your meeting, then they would get the precedence. But in the event that there's nothing happening in the community space, it is intended to be a community space, right? So the only reason we would ask you to move is if someone wanted to pay to use the space. But otherwise, it is intended to be a community asset. And so if you're talking about a one-hour meeting or something like that, how long are your meetings? You can't say three or four hours now. <laughs> I mean, if that's what she uses, she can. <laughs> We, we meet two and a half hours. We, That's on a Wednesday morning at 10.30. Fourth, <coughs> Fourth Wednesday in the month. Is that so, once a month? Once a month. So again, the only thing that would prohibit you all from using the space would be someone that's paying to use it. If no one is paying to use the space, it would be yours. Okay. And that goes for any of these meetings, right? My name, my name is Lawrence Milligan. I lived in the community for six years now. My biggest thing that I have is you're going to build this museum. What are you going to do to prevent the homeless 
from overrunning it, just like you're doing with the Evan Plaza that is happening right now? Yeah, fair question. For right? six years, fair whoever's question. been elected hasn't done anything because they are over there stealing and constantly going through the neighborhoods, stealing everything from people's property to plants, trash cans, everything, and then you guys aren't doing anything about it. Code enforcement doesn't do anything. That big facility, they don't want to do anything to help us at all. They tell us to call the police. The police come out, you know what they tell us? It's not our fault. Call code enforcement. Code enforcement tells us to call the police. What are you guys doing as the councilman to represent this neighborhood to help us out? We're tired of it. We are tired. Thank you for your question. And yes, six years, uh, I got elected in 21, and I will tell you what we have done on Evans, particularly uh, those black benches that was installed on Evans uh, during the plaza. They were long benches without to allow the homeless to sleep. We went in and we took a rail and put it down the middle of it to prevent them from laying and sleeping on that bench. We, no, no, well, let me ask, no, let me ask, your, let me ask your question, sir. Sir, let me answer your question, sir. Okay, sir. Listen, I don't mind talking to you all night, but I'm gonna finish my. I let you ask talk, so let me talk. We're gonna be respectful to one another, okay? So, anybody else have an additional question? We got about three more minutes, and then we're gonna uh, finish this. From from what it sounds, you're gonna tear the community center down regardless. No, ma'am. Okay, that's what it sounds, and. What you're going to put there in this place remains to be seen. So you're saying no, that that's not true. So then you're... It's not true. I heard her say that it's more expensive to keep renovating it than to just tear it down and build a new one. Correct. So, so the conversation that we're having tonight, I'm going to answer... Let me, let me answer the question. Let me answer the question. Let me answer the question. This meeting tonight is to get feedback from you. The city has not entered into any agreement with the National Juneteenth Museum, has not entered into any uh, 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 written agreement. This was a proposal from the National Juneteenth Museum to the city of Fort Worth. It's important that we bring this conversation to you, and that's what this conversation is to you. We wanted to update you on the proposal, and secondly, we wanted to update you on the repairs that need to be done to that building. At some point, that building will become unusable. Right now, we're using it, but at some point, that building will. We don't know how many years we have left on that building, and so we want to make sure you have the information. So nothing has taken place. The next steps, you have that written down. You're going to take a, a poll, how many people want to see it, how many people don't want to see it. We're going to have another a conversation to make sure we get all everybody involved in it. Once we collect those, we'll come back to the community and let you know how we plan to. Sir, I'm still, I'm, I, sir, I, listen, I, I'm not gonna, you're not gonna disrupt this meeting. You're not gonna disrupt this meeting. Ma'am, ask your question. Okay, question number one, if you're getting funds from the Juneteenth Museum in compensation for using that space, what happens to those funds? And then question number two, we need a, it's called a lock cop. Those things that's, that stand up in the Walmart parking lot and have a camera mm -hmm. pointing down. We need one of those in Evans Avenue Plaza. So two questions in one. I can work on that. We did it over there at the, uh, what was the first question? I couldn't the hear. The first question was, um, what do you, if, if Jared is paying you for the, the use of the, the land and uh, to, to build the Juneteenth Museum, what is the city doing with those funds? Okay. Do we have somebody that's going to, so it's going to be a long-term lease, David, do we have anybody? We don't even have no discussions on that at this moment. Yeah. We don't even have uh, a discuss. We'll, we'll get back with you on that answer. Okay. Two more questions. I see you, Ms. Opal Lee. Yeah. My question is, it's kind of a question and a statement. If the Southside Community Center has already been deemed that it's past its life expectancy, and we don't, hypothetically, don't get the, the museum, how much longer will it be before that we can still occupy the building and use it? And then if we don't get the museum to go somewhere else, when we get to that time, what do we do? What was the last part, the door exit? Oh, if, 
if the building goes past the life expectancy yes, and we don't get the museum and there's no plans to build another community center, what do we do then? So it seems as if the museum is the best way for us to get a new uh, community center to be able to still have the programs. Is that right, wrong, or what do we do? We're gonna we're gonna answer a question, and then hopefully Dr. Lee, we're gonna come to you next. I think I got Miss. Hi, everybody. My name is Dave Lewis. I'm the deputy director of the Park and Recreation Department. One thing that's important to know: we've also launched a community center study. What this study is going to help us determine is what community centers need renovated, where places in the city most need a community center. So I think this study will help us identify that. But our main purpose for being here tonight is to listen to if the programs need to find a new house, what's the best house? Is it Hazel Harvey? Is it Chambly Library? Is it a Tatiana Carr Jefferson? So that's what we're here tonight is getting your input on the best location if we do end up relocating these programs. So to answer your question, we're doing a study to figure out what is the future of that center. Is there a better location? Or as Monique mentioned, community centers have a service radius of about a mile and a half. And we're a city of over 350 square miles. So you can see it's pretty hard to get one every mile and a half. So really trying to understand through the data where those centers should be. Does that answer the question? Is that for additional questions? What's that QR code for? Okay, the QR code will go to the survey. If you have uh, additional questions that are not answered, can we can we collect those tonight, Michelle? Okay. Okay, staff. If city staff, if you're here, if you can raise your hand. Uh, so that we can make sure we get the ballots turned in to them. We're going to let, go ahead, Dr. Opali, please. So we've got, a, we've got ourselves a prompt problem with the homeless. And so what are we going to do about that first? Can we not for take butler that is vacant and do something about that for homeless folk? Why can't we? So, homeless has already been concentrated in Lancaster, which should not have happened you're over wrong, 70. You're wrong. There's you're wrong. Problem. And what you're not going to do is There's disrespect me in my meeting. Every single okay. Ever Sir, you say you've been here six people, years. 30 people. Okay. Thank you. Well, let me say this. Obviously, you've been obnoxious tonight, and we, we, we don't appreciate you disrespecting the meeting. If you have any other additional questions, I want to I take an opportunity to thank you guys for coming out tonight and hearing, and no, it's, we're, we're closing the meeting out. Thank you guys for coming out tonight and hearing for your concerns. If you have any additional questions, you can do that QR code, and we will... Uh, get with you next time. Thank you guys for